So the one you got to make sure your patients are sitting up straight. And this is typically after cervical manipulation. One of the thing, one of the identifiers for the clinical prediction rule for cervical thrust, or really thoracic thrust for cervical pain, was limited extension, no greater than 30, or pain, pain with extension. Most patients are going to have a loss of cervical extension, even lumbar extension. The average patient flexes thousands of times a day. What are you going to lose? You're not going to lose flexion. Everyone always wants to stretch into flexion. They're like, oh, but it feels so good to stretch my back like this. Well, if flexion was going to make you better, it would have made you better by now. Right. So typically, they need to go into extension. If they had central or bilateral complaints, a good thing to start off with is retraction. And again, one of the failures of, it's like, oh, I gave a patient retra retractions, but it wasn't making them better. So starting off like this, you at least got to make sure that you're getting to end range. And someone's end range might only be here. But I like to show just really to get to end range to retract until your sternum raises. And if they're looking up a little bit, that's OK. They can't look up too much, because then you're having a loss of upper cervical flexion. So as a progression, you maybe start with 10 of these an hour. If they say, I may be better, but I'm not completely better, you need to progress your force. And maybe you do that over a couple of appointments. So the force progression after that is, I always push on the maxilla. I don't ever like to push in the mandible. They say that, oh, it's fine if you don't have a TMJ patient, if you're not a TMJ patient. Well, I don't want to make anyone a TMJ patient because the problem is when the mandible goes posteriorly from a forward head anyway, and that's when the disc sublux anteriorly. So you don't want to sublux any discs potentially by pushing on the mandible. So why don't, why don't you just push on the maxilla? As long as your hand doesn't smell, it's not a problem. If your hand smells, just wash it. So retract over pressure. Retract over pressure. And when I really started hammering away with that with patients, I didn't need to do <clears throat> this as much, which would be the next progression, retraction, do a little wiggle, 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 wiggle. That last little wiggle is a little bit extra joint play just to get you moving to end range. Now, since most cervical patients, uh, as long as they don't have like a ridiculous complaint, you typically, at least in my experience, and some McKenzie guys would argue, you don't need to do this as much. I find that most of them get better with that. For the ones who aren't, then you can progress. So it's, you, gotta, you wanna make sure that when you come back, that you don't come back into a protracted position because that kind of defeats the purpose. Now, if someone had unilateral complaints, and again, this is using myself as an example, I used to just ask someone to manipulate me. Once I was at a McKenzie course, and ironically enough, no one there could manipulate me. So, the instructor was saying, again, one of the failures is not taken in the end range. Because I was trying to do it, and I was like, wow, damn, it hurts. So I needed overpressure. So I, if I retracted, and I pulled, and I pulled, and I was there for two days, and I was basically doing this probably about 100 times an hour. But I noticed that if it was maybe 8 out of 10 pain, and we're talking pain during motion, no worse. Increase, no worse. It didn't last afterward, even if I was a little sore. It also felt like I was going to tear my right upper trap. But after about an hour of that, I was like, this kind of feels better. I just kept on doing and doing and doing, and by the end of the day, it was full. And I think one of the things that works really well about that is you are getting the end range. It's still where the magic happens. Would a manipulation have done it? Absolutely. But one, you may not choose to do manipulation in your practice. Two, patient may not be appropriate for it, or they may not want it after you talk them out of it with an informed consent. But that, that was like the, I mean, even though I was McKenzie certified for years, I thought, wow, I mean, that's a great home program. The thing is, you have, to be able to, you have to be able to explain to your patient why it's so important and the difference between increase and worse. Worse is it remains worse afterward. Worse is it peripheralizes afterward. Worse is you have a loss of range of motion afterward. But if it hurts when you do it, but it doesn't persist, and your range of motion is better, and your symptoms centralize, or they just abolish, then that's what you do. So after a cervical thrust for bilateral complaints or traction, 
retraction with overpressure, retraction with extension. For unilateral complaints, typically as a derangement, you would choose to move into the direction. Since most facets anyway are locked up and forward because people are forward, you want to close it down, that's why you're going into the direction. Just like you would with a down glide thrust. So, once you practice that um, with the cervical retractions and extensions and then the overpressures, try that on yourself. 